So Dr. Um, Dr. Kim, thanks for doing our introduction today, but I just want to officially welcome everyone to Grand Rounds this morning. Our speaker will be introduced by Dr. Kim. And as a reminder to everyone, the CME code is in the participants list at the top or in the bottom right hand of your screen. So I'll hand things over to Dr. Kim. Great. Thanks, Julia. So good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah. I've had the good fortune and privilege of being uh, the interim division chief for GI for the past uh, couple of years or so, and I've gotten to know Maria Khan and Susan Wilson very well. So we're excited to hear about uh, from both of them about inflammatory bowel disease and updates. Uh, as some of you may know, Susan Wilson is part of our team uh, as a registered dietitian. She's a president. She is the president of the Kentucky Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and actually, she is the uh, past. Uh, recipient of the Dietitian of the Year Award for 2020 for the state of Kentucky as, rec as recognized nationally. Dr. Khan, as many of you know, did her pediatric residency here uh, before she went on to do her pediatric gastroenterology fellowship at Nation Nationwide Children's in Columbus. And she is the recent recipient of an Improved Care Now Award focused on inflammatory bowel disease, which she's going to talk about uh, as part of this presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Susan and I are very excited to share these updates in the care of pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. So the objectives of our talk this morning is to briefly go over what is inflammatory bowel disease, the histopathologic features, etiopathogenesis, and incidence and prevalence in the pediatric population. We'll also be discussing the different therapeutic options and what is the Improved Care Now network. So inflammatory bowel diseases, or IBD, are chronic relapsing and remitting conditions of the intestine that include Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and indeterminate colitis. It can present with several different symptoms such as abdominal pain, bloody stools, diarrhea, weight loss, growth problems, and fatigue. Crohn's disease affects any part of the GI tract, leading to inflammation involving all layers of the intestinal wall, while ulcerative colitis involves the rectum and colon, leading to inflammation and ulceration of the intestinal lining. IBD is caused by a multifactorial effect from a patient that is genetically predisposed to an overactive innate immune system or defective host immunoregulation. Other factors that also play a role in IBD are environmental triggers such as diet and stress, as well as the microbes in the GI tract. So the epidemiology of IBD, um, the prevalence of IBD is about 100 to 100,000, and incidence is 8 to 15 per 100,000. There's a bimodal distribution between 20 to 40 years and 60 to 80 years, and it is greater in westernized countries. Wilkes first introduced ulcerative colitis in 1875, and regional ileitis was published in JAMA by Crohn in 1932. Since the middle of the 20th century, incidence of IBD has increased in the Western world. And at the turn of the 21st century, the overall incidence of IBD plateaued in certain regions of the Western world. However, pediatric onset IBD continued to show a rise in incidence. And the overall incidence is increasing worldwide with a steep rise in newly industrialized countries and in adolescents in industrialized countries. The incidence of IBD may have stabilized among adults in North America, but it has continued to rise in children with the highest percentage increase observed among children under five years of age, which is called very early onset IBD. This rising incidence has caused the pediatric prevalence of IBD to increase by 133% in the last decade in the US reaching 77 per 100,000 children in 2016. Compared to adults, children with IBD present with more severe, aggressive, and progressive phenotype with unique complications, specifically growth failure and delayed puberty. Treatment of pediatric IBD has unique challenges such as limited therapeutic options with considerably fewer treatments approved by the FDA. This poses significant limitations for the pediatric gastroenterologist. Within the past two decades, the advent of anti-tumor necrosis factor agents has radically modified the management and disease course of IBD in both adults and children, resulting in greater remission and mucosal healing rates, fewer surgeries and hospitalizations, improved quality of life, and notably for children, correction of growth and failure. 
Given the progressive and aggressive nature of this disease, especially in the pediatric population, we know we need to make appropriate intervention and control the disease early in its course, making traditional step-up therapy concept more outdated. And the new standard of treatment are personalized therapy, mucosal healing, and sustained remission. So step-up therapy was considered standard therapy for remission and maintenance with first starting with anti-inflammatory drugs and escalating to biologic therapy, while the top-down therapy was early aggressive use of biologics at initial diagnosis. Mucosal healing is associated with better outcomes, providing the foundational evidence for achieving deep remission as the ultimate target in IBD. There's greater likelihood of achieving mucosal healing at one year with the use of anti-TNF-alpha agents as first-line therapy in luminal Crohn's disease. These findings support the top-down therapeutic approach in achieving deep remission in pediatric Crohn's disease. Linear growth failure is a frequent complication of Crohn's disease in prepubescent children, which is an important therapeutic target that must be achieved early in the disease so that irreversible sequelae can be mitigated. So infliximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody against TNF-alpha that's given intravenously. Dosing is either 5 milligrams per kilogram or 10 milligrams per kilogram, and there is induction dosing, and then there's maintenance typically every eight weeks. Adalimumab is a recombinant human monoclonal antibody against TNF-alpha that's given subcutaneously. There's weight-based dosing for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease for induction and maintenance therapy. In children and adolescents, the anti-TNF-alpha agents infliximab and adalimumab are currently the only biologics approved by the FDA for treatment of pediatric IBD. Infliximab was approved for Crohn's disease in 2006 and ulcerative colitis in 2011, and adalimumab was approved for Crohn's disease in 2012, and most recent for ulcerative colitis just in 2021. So the history of anti-TNF therapy are based on these trials that we'll be briefly reviewing that looked at specifically the pediatric population, which then led to their FDA approval. REACH was a landmark trial showing efficacy of infliximab in pediatric Crohn's disease. It was a multi-center, randomized, open-label study of infliximab in pediatric patients with moderately to severely active Crohn's disease. In the REACH study, the efficacy of a three-dose induction regimen of infliximab in reducing signs and symptoms of Crohn's disease in children was evaluated. They also compared the efficacy and safety through 54 weeks of maintenance therapy given every eight weeks or given every 12 weeks. And they found that the pediatric patients responding to an induction regimen of infliximab were more likely to be in clinical response and remission at week 54 where their maintenance therapy was given every eight rather than every 12. It showed that infliximab is effective in treatment of moderately to severely active Crohn's disease in children. The Imagine One study evaluated the safety and efficacy of adalimumab double-blind maintenance dosing regimens following open label induction for pediatric patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. This trial represented the largest double-blind study conducted at the time with an anti-TNF agent in children with Crohn's disease. It included infliximab naive patients as well as those who failed infliximab. Patients received open label induction therapy with subcutaneous adalimumab, and then the groups were given double-blind maintenance therapy with adalimumab at high dose, which was 40 and then 20 milligrams for body weight greater than 40 kilograms, or 20 milligrams and 10 milligrams for those less than 40 kilograms. And more children who received high compared with low dose were in remission at week 26, but the difference between dose groups was not statistically significant. This study showed that adalimumab induced and maintained clinical remission of children with Crohn's disease with a safety profile comparable to that of adult patients with Crohn's disease. So the pediatric risk stratification study was a multi-center propensity match inception cohort of 913 children with inflammatory non-structuring Crohn's disease at disease onset. And they were enrolled and prospectively followed for complications in response to therapies. Early anti-TNF alpha therapy use led to substantial reduction in penetrating but not fibrostenotic complications. Clinical remission and linear growth normalization was shown at one year, 
in newly diagnosed Crohn's disease treated with anti-TNF-alpha therapy within the first three months after diagnosis. So the results from the RISC study provide some of the highest quality data supporting the early use of anti-TNF-alpha therapy in children with Crohn's disease at risk for severe disease progression. Previous retrospective pediatric ulcerative colitis studies had limited ability to describe disease progression and identify predictors of treatment response. So the PROTECT multi-center inception cohort aimed to identify characteristics associated with outcomes following standardized therapy after initial diagnosis of pediatric ulcerative colitis. It included patients aged 4 to 17 years on initial standardized treatment with mesalamine or corticosteroids. And what they found was corticosteroid-free remission at weeks 12 and 52 on mesalamine was achieved in 34% and 38% respectively. And the strongest predictor for corticosteroid-free remission was induction of a clinical remission by week four. So predictors of escalation to anti-TNF-alpha therapy, what they found was low vitamin D level, anemia, decreased rectal biopsy eosinophil count, but most importantly, not achieving remission by week four. So early use of biologic therapy in patients at risk of severe disease progression was key. So together, the risk and predict demonstrate the need to individualize therapeutic choices based on risk factors for severe disease and treatment goals rather than just using the broad one-size-fits-all step-up approach. Therapeutic drug monitoring is the measurement of drug, anti-drug antibody serum concentrations. It's used to guide clinical decision-making and achieve specific treatment goals. Lower drug levels have been associated with drug antibody formation and greater likelihood of loss of response. The treat-to-target approach has been associated with improved disease outcomes. And the superiority of proactive versus reactive therapeutic drug monitoring is still under debate. Currently, societal guidelines support the role of reactive therapeutic drug monitoring with dose optimization at the time of loss of response. Reactive therapeutic drug monitoring based management doesn't take into account the inter and intra individual variability in drug clearance. So to this end, proactive therapeutic drug monitoring may allow individualized dosing adjustment and potentially lead to higher rate of remission, fewer IBD related complications, lower rates of immunogenicity and better drug retention. As and colleagues provided additional evidence suggesting the superiority of proactive over reactive therapeutic drug monitoring in the pilot study. In this study, a higher proportion of patients in the proactive arm achieved the primary endpoint of sustained corticosteroid-free clinical remission. Dose intensification was required in almost 90% of proactive group in order to achieve a modest trough threshold of 5 micrograms per milliliter. A maintenance therapeutic level above 10 micrograms per milliliter was associated with a higher rate of clinical remission. Therapeutic drug monitoring is a key component of managing IBD patients on anti-TNF-alpha therapy. Anti-TNF-alpha therapy use has been linked to an increased risk of infection. There was a meta-analysis of 65 pediatric studies, 9,516 patient years of follow-up, and what they found was the rate of serious infections in children with IBD suggested to be significantly lower than the rate in adults. It was estimated to be 3.5 per 100 patient years, and the rate of serious infections associated with anti-TNF-alpha therapy agents represents half the rate of serious infections for children receiving corticosteroids. So given the top-down treatment approach strongly encouraging the use of biologics as first-line therapy, is there still a role of thiopurine, such as methotrexate, 6MP, and azathioprine as monotherapy for the induction and maintenance of remission for pediatric IBD? So thiopurine, 6MP, and azathioprine have no role as monotherapy for induction for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis because their onset of action between 8 to 16 weeks is too long. The effectiveness of thiopurines for maintenance of remission in adults with Crohn's disease was summarized in Cochrane reviews, and the results of adult trials have shown that azathioprine was more effective than placebo. Evidence of pediatric Crohn's disease is much weaker, with only one small randomized controlled trial, which showed lower relapse rate with 6MP versus placebo at one year. 
And the remaining studies in pediatrics have been observational and they report a wide range of remission rates and no significant improvement on growth. So when it comes to methotrexate in Crohn's disease, the landmark multicenter induction trial was done by Fagan and colleagues of 141 adults with steroid dependency. They were randomized to 25 milligrams methotrexate weekly versus placebo and show that at week 16, clinical remission of 40% with methotrexate versus 19% placebo. For maintenance of remission, a systematic review of three adult trials showed that 15 milligrams weekly methotrexate was more effective than placebo in maintenance of remission. So this data is from a systematic review meta-analysis done on six pediatric studies from 2006 to 2015, which were multi-center and retrospective. The overall pooled clinical remission rate was within three to, for three to six months was 57.7%, and the 12-month pool clinical remission rate for maintenance was 37.1%. These studies only looked at clinical remission, and only two studies evaluated growth in some fashion and noted positive effects on height. So to summarize where we should use immunomodulators in Crohn's disease, this was derived from ECHO, which is the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization, and ESPAGAN, which is the European Society of Pediatric GI, Hepatology, and Nutrition. And the key point to remember is to stratify risk of our Crohn's <laughs> patients up front. So they have low risk with mild to moderate luminal inflammation with no stricturing or penetrating disease and no concerns of growth failure, then you can consider it. So if you have active Crohn's disease with low risk, you'll start induction therapy, typically either with exclusive enteral nutrition or corticosteroids. And if treatment target is reached, then the immunomodulator for maintenance therapy can be started. If treatment target is not maintained, then you could try one more attempt with first line therapy and the, or step up to anti-TNF therapy. So let's look at ulcerative colitis now. Reviewing adult randomized controlled trials, azathioprine has been shown to be superior to placebo for prevention of relapse in ulcerative colitis. There are no randomized controlled trials in children. There's data from large multi-center registries such as the Pediatric IBD Collaborative Research Group. And they had a registry that followed an inception cohort of newly diagnosed children with IBD and they evaluated 133 patients new diagnosis IBD, and they followed them in one year and noted 49% clinical remission. Another multi-center study in Italy showed similar data of approximately 50% steroid-free remission at one year, but this study also included some data on mucosal healing reporting 37% at one year. So when it comes to monotherapy for ulcerative colitis with methotrexate, Looking at these two adult studies of methotrexate monotherapy, the meteor and merit, there's lack of efficacy in adults as the end result was not achieved in these studies. In pediatrics, there's only small retrospective cases with no endorsement from evidence-based treatment guidelines to use in ulcerative colitis. So looking at the suggested management derived from ECHO and ESPAGAN, if you have chronically active ulcerative colitis while on mesalamine or greater or equal to two flares, or severe attack while on mesalamine, steroid dependency, or following a discharge from acute severe colitis, you could consider adding a thiopurine. And if the disease remains active or has frequent flares still, consider anti-TNF medication. However, when you're considering the top-down approach, if you have an acute severe colitis that requires hospitalization, practically speaking, we would already be starting them on anti-TNF therapy. So the SONIC trial was a post hoc analysis that evaluated different composite remission measures at week 26 in patients with Crohn's disease. It was noted that combination therapy with infliximab with an immunomodulator was more effective in achieving various composite remission measures versus azathioprine or infliximab monotherapy. This led to azathioprine to be the agent of choice for combination therapy. However, this study was published just when they were becoming more aware of hepatosplenic lymphoma, and they began to pay attention to methotrexate. The COMMIT trial evaluated combo therapy with methotrexate and infliximab versus infliximab alone. This was published four years after SONIC, and the primary outcome of the study was steroid-free remission at week 14 and maintenance of remission through week 50, but these were not achieved. However, what they found was that combo therapy was less likely to develop antibodies 
and they noted higher trough drug concentrations. So for pediatric data regarding combo therapy, I wanted to show this figure from the study of the PEDS IBD research group. This study looked at immunomodulator use with infliximab. They took 502 children and divided them into groups with no combo therapy, less than six months, and greater than six months. In children with Crohn's disease, concomitant treatment with an immunomodulator for more than six months after starting infliximab therapy increases the chances that patients will remain on infliximab. In boys, methotrexate appears to increase the durability of infliximab therapy compared with thiopurines. In the pediatric IBD, the use of combination therapy may be appropriate in children who exhibit a higher risk of disease complication, children with immunogenic loss of response to previous anti-TNF-alpha therapy, or children who may benefit from the synergistic effect between the two agents. We know that with children, the concept of risk is at the forefront of families and providers, and there are many years of disease burden when they are diagnosed. So you have to consider the short and long-term risk are, they, they are important to consider. So I'll focus on the big risk of malignancy, even though absolute risk is low, this is always the parent's biggest concern. So looking at the pediatric data from the developed registry, it was created to look at long-term safety and clinical outcomes in children receiving infliximab and other medications. 5,700 children were studied, and there were 15 children identified with malignancy. 13 out of the 15 were exposed to thiopurines. When compared to reference database, patients exposed to 6-MP and azathioprine had significant increased risk of malignancy from primary lymphomas. And similar to adult data, discontinuation of thiopurines for more than a year reduces malignancy risk. So although not a true malignancy, five out of the five patients who developed hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis were exposed to thiopurines. So some takeaways for immunomodulator therapy. Methotrexate does have a role for induction and maintenance of remission in mild, moderate luminal Crohn's disease. Azathioprine and 6MP have a role for maintenance of remission in mild, moderate Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but you really have to look at the risk-benefit ratio. And immunomodulators currently have a role in combo therapy with anti-TNF agents, with methotrexate being the preferred agent. So why do patients fail anti-TNF alpha therapy? Um, in this study from Clinical Therapeutics in 2011, there were, these were the highlights seen in patients who failed anti-TNF. They had low serum drug levels, high BMI, male sex, high inflammatory burden, both extended disease and disease severity, and low serum albumin. So in the search to enlarge different therapeutic choices, newer biologics, vedolizumab and nusikinumab, have shown effectiveness in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and were recently granted FDA approval, although only in adults. In pediatric practice, off-label use of these biologics have been increasing. Vitalizumab is an anti-integrin therapy approved in May 2014 for adult patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It acts on the alpha-4 beta-7 integrin receptor molecule present on the surface of lymphocytes, blocking the ability to bind to its MAGCAM1 counterpart on the intestinal endothelium. This interaction inhibits lymphocyte migration to inflamed gastrointestinal tissue. And to note, vetalizumab has gut specificity. Gemini was a landmark adult trial which confirmed efficacy and safety in treating patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and induction of mucosal healing. But the pediatric evidence is still limited. Using an adaptive dosing of 5 milligrams per kilogram up to 300 milligrams, combined pediatric studies have reported week 14 and 22 clinical remission rates to be 37% to 76% and 34% to 71% respectively. Similar to what's seen in adult cohorts, remission rates have been numerically higher in ulcerative colitis as compared to Crohn's disease and in anti-TNF alpha naive children compared to those two patients with prior exposure. Vetalizumab is shown to induce mucosal healing endoscopically and histologically at a rate of 38%. The favorable risk-benefit profile makes vetalizumab an ideal therapeutic choice for pediatric IBD. It's gut-directed, so we do not see as many black box warnings as of yet. However, an important limitation is that it has a delayed onset of action for which corticosteroid use 
as bridge therapy is often necessary in a population that's already increased risk of growth failure and bone loss. Usakinumab or Stellara is a therapeutic human IgG1 kappa monoclonal antibody that binds to interleukins 12 and 23, cytokines that modulate lymphocyte function, including T helper 1 and 17 subsets. Usakinumab demonstrated clinical efficacy in the UNITY trials for induction and maintenance of remission in adult Crohn's disease. Endoscopic healing has also been reported in post hoc analysis of the UNITY trials. And the UNIFI trials are adult trials for ulcerative colitis with emerging data. These are observational cohort studies in children with Crohn's disease refractory to anti-TNF alpha therapies. In Siobhan's and colleagues, 44 patients were studied. Long-term outcomes at 12 months noted clinical response at 45% and clinical remission at 40% at week greater than 26. So overall, these results suggest that usikinumab is efficacious in pediatric patients with IBD, but larger cohort studies will be required to validate the efficacy, safety profile, and optimized dosing regimen in this population. Usikinumab uses an IV loading dose followed by self-injection, typically every eight weeks. So what's the role of diet therapy in IBD? Diet is associated with new onset IBD. What they found was high dietary intakes of total fats, polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, and meat were associated with an increased risk of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. High fiber and fruit intakes were associated with decreased Crohn's disease risk, and high vegetable intake was associated with decreased ulcerative colitis risk. The pathogenesis of Crohn's disease appeared to involve alterations of the microbiome. And diet may play a role in the generation of inflammation by modulating the microbiome, tight junctions, and mucus layer. So what's out there for diet and Crohn's disease? There's exclusive enteral nutrition, which is a formula-based, no-solid food diet used for induction and maintenance therapy for Crohn's disease. There's several different types of whole food therapeutic diets, but for, the, for this talk, I want to focus on the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, or CDED. Exclusive enteral nutrition leads to remission in part by the removal of specific dietary ingredients that trigger inflammation or promote a more pro-inflammatory microbiome. Corticosteroids are most commonly used medication to induce remission in the U.S., but it poses particular risks such as growth retardation, low bone mineral density, adrenal suppression, and body image dissatisfaction. So as an alternative, exclusive enteral nutrition is used as induction therapy, and it has very little adverse effects, except for maybe some gastrointestinal tolerability. It was most frequently used in Europe, and it's becoming more popular in North America. Swaminath and colleagues performed a systematic review and meta-analysis on the efficacy of corticosteroids versus exclusive enteral nutrition in the pediatric population. And what they found was EEN was as effective as corticosteroids in inducing remission, Intestinal healing was significantly more likely among patients receiving EEN compared to corticosteroids, and there was no difference in the frequency of biomarker normalization, including CRP and fecal calprotectin. The pros of the EEN is that it's, it's, it is as effective as steroids. It leads to mucosal healing. It works quickly, it improves nutritional status, and it improves bone health with no side effects. The cons is that it demands resources education, and dedication with limited long-term benefit. So exclusive enteral nutrition requires a firm commitment from the child plus the family to avoid all other food intake for at least six to eight weeks. So a barrier previously to using dietary therapy was the absence of more palatable and sustained dietary strategy. So this is why CDED is so exciting as it is whole food diet coupled with partial enteral nutrition. And it's designed to reduce exposure to dietary components hypothesized to negatively affect the microbiome, intestinal barrier, and intestinal immunity. It has shown promising ability to induce remission and decrease inflammation in case series in both in children and adults with Crohn's disease, including patients with secondary loss response to anti-TNF therapy. So this was a 12-week prospective study trial of children with mild and moderate Crohn's disease. Children were randomly assigned to a group that received CDED plus 50% of calories from formula for six weeks, which was phase one, 
followed by CDED with 25% partial nutrition from week seven to 12, which was phase two. Or a group that received EEN for six weeks, followed by a free diet with 25% PEN or partial enteral nutrition from weeks seven to 12. And the patients were evaluated at baseline weeks three, six, and 12. And the primary endpoint intolerance was significantly different, favoring CDED plus partial enteral nutrition over EEN with 97.5% versus 73.7%. And secondary clinical endpoints at week six indicated no statistical difference in response in corticosteroid free remission. So both diets were effective in induction remission by week six for children with mild to moderate Crohn's disease, and the combination CDED plus partial endonutrition induced sustained remission in a significantly higher portion of patients than EEN and produced change in the fecal microbiome associated with remission. So I'm going to pass it over to Susan Wilson, who will talk to you more about CDED. Hi there. Thank you, Dr. Khan, and um, thank you guys for allowing me to speak with you this morning. I am going to briefly go through the CDED diet with you. For our CDED patients, we use the Modulife program. Patients can only gain access to it if I have set them up and have granted them access, as it should only be followed under the care of somebody familiar with this, with this diet. They can access the program online or can download the Modulife app. It's great because it provides them with meal plans, grocery shopping lists, hundreds of recipes. They can record their food log or symptoms, and it sends me regular updates on the patient. It's also great because it provides them other types of support like emotional or psychological support. CDED includes three phases, which I'll go over in more detail in the following slides. The first two phases are each six weeks and are meant to induce remission. During phase one, the patients need to consume half their needs from modulin formula, which was created specifically for this diet. Others can be used, but if a patient won't accept this formula, we can use some of the other formulas. The other half of their caloric needs needs to come from a very specific list of mandatory foods and allowed foods that must be followed strictly. Phase two is a bit more liberalized regarding the variety of foods and the volume of food. Prior to starting this phase, patients will need to have their nutritional needs re-estimated and 25% of their needs will come from the formula while 75% will come from a somewhat wider variety of foods it still must be followed very strictly. The third and final phase or maintenance phase is just that. It is a long-term phase meant to keep the patient in remission. It really is meant to be followed going forward as a lifestyle change, which um, you know I know sounds a little bit strict, but if you think about it, other diagnoses involve lifetime dietary changes like celiac disease. This phase is very liberalized and is followed more 80% of the time. 25 of the, of the percent of the patient's needs will still come from the formula. So now we'll go into a little bit more detail of each phase. Phase one, as I said, requires that 50% of the patient's nutritional needs come from the prescribed formula. The other half of the patient's needs come from food. Phase one and phase two include five mandatory foods. These include five to seven ounces of fresh chicken, not frozen, two fresh potatoes that have pe been peeled, cooked, and cooled. This is important because the cooking and the cooling process converts the car carbohydrates in the potato to a more resistant starch, which provides nutrients for the beneficial bacteria. It includes one peeled apple and two bananas. These foods are non-negotiable, which is why they are called mandatory. Patients are allowed to consume three and a half to five ounces of fresh lean fish once a week. Again, fresh, not frozen. They can have all the white rice, white rice noodles, or white rice flour that they want. One avocado, five fresh strawberries, one slice of lemon, two tomatoes, two peeled cucumbers, one carrot, one cup of fresh spinach, and three lettuce leaves. Patients are also allowed freshly squeezed orange juice, herbal teas, 
sweeteners like honey or table sugar, and condiments like olive oil or canola oil and fresh herbs and spices. Do you notice that fresh is a key word here? There is a disallowed list, but to be quite honest, I tell patients that unless it's on the mandatory or the allowed list, it's not allowed. Phase two offers a wider variety of foods and more volume of food. Formula is reduced to 25% of the patient's total energy needs, while 75% will come from specific foods. Patients still must consume the same mandatory foods as phase one. However, the allowed foods is broadened. During phase two, patients can consume all the allowed foods from phase one, in addition to one can of tuna packed in oil, half a sweet potato per day, one slice of whole grain bread per day, lentils, peas, chickpeas, beans, almonds, walnuts, quinoa, oatmeal, and a wider variety of fruits and vegetables, although still somewhat limited. From weeks 10, however, all fruits and vegetables, except for a very select few, are allowed. The maintenance phase is quite liberalized to promote a more whole, fresh food diet for the majority of the time, while allowing some room for eating out and some processed foods. It's more of an 80 on, 20 off kind of diet. There are still some recommended disallowed foods, but this list is quite small. It includes mostly highly processed foods. Patients should still be consuming around 25% of their needs from modulin. What's great about the Modulife program though, is that it has tons of recipes which include the formula as an ingredient, so patients don't necessarily just have to drink it. Um, I'll tell you, I have personally followed the CBE diet to experience firsthand what I will be asking our patients to do. I'll be honest, going into it, I was skeptical because I absolutely love food and I love to eat. The first week was, um, was pretty hard because I had to be very conscious all the time of what I could eat and um, there was a lot of meal prep and planning. However, after the first week, I didn't have to think so much about it, and I started coming up with my own recipes using the mand mandatory and allowed foods, and it actually became kind of fun. When I talk to our patients about this diet, I really do try to focus more on what they can have rather than what they can't, because it truly comes down to how you approach it and how you present it to the patients. Thank you, Susan. And so moving forward, so how is our group at Northern Children's trying to improve the quality of care given to our IBD population? So we've recently joined the Improved Care Now Network. And what it is is a collaborative chronic care network of 90 care centers across the world. And it's a, the largest and fastest growing pediatric IBD registry in the world. It works successfully to improve the quality of care delivered to children with IBD at clinic. So the initial focus of the Improved Care Now is to build a quality improvement infrastructure at each center, develop and implement the recommendations of the Improved Care Now model IBD care guideline, measure and report the performance at each center and all centers, identify gaps between the recommended care and what's actually provided, but then implement quality improvement projects to close those gaps. So centers have been applying quality improvement methods to improve initial diagnostic testing and evaluation, standardizing the classification of the severity, phenotype, and extent of the disease, improve the dedication and treatment of poor nutrition and growth, and improve the use of immunomodulators and other biological therapies. And the focus is on increasing the percentage of patients with inactive disease, sustained remission, prevention of relapses, reducing the number of patients receiving corticosteroids, and avoiding adverse effects from therapy. So how does it work? So data is collected about the patient disease status and care provided at the visit. And then the data is entered into the Improved Care Now database, which is a secure server at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. All the data is then analyzed and reports with tables and graphs are prepared and made available to then each practice center. And the core QI team, which would be me, Susan, and our nurse, Lacey Comstock, will then review data tables and graphs to identify gaps between its goal and actual performance. And then the center then implements plan, do, act, 
quality improvement cycles to close these gaps, resulting in improvements in the care provided. So I'd like to thank Norton Children's Hospital Foundation for funding our Membership to Improve Care Now network. We have submitted our IRB and just received our official welcome in the beginning of October, and we're very excited to get started. So thank you for your attention this morning, and we're open for any questions. Uh, thanks, Dr. Khan. Uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, the the data that uh, has been established in using uh, IL-1223 blockade with Stellara, did they break it down into various age groups? One, I'm just wondering uh, if the very early onset of the younger kids with uh, Crohn's tend to be uh, IL-10 deficient. And there's an interplay between IL-23 and IL-10. And I wonder if uh, if we look just at the youngest kids, we may see more strength in using uh, ustekinumab. Have they looked at on yeah, an age basis? Oh. Yeah, so on the, um, on the study, it wasn't looked at that age group particularly. But we, um, so that's an interesting concept. But we know with the VOIBD or the very early onset IBD, um, they typically really respond well to anti-TNF alpha therapy early on, but um, definitely probably studies moving forward will look at Stellar and that age group. Thanks. Hey, this is Sarah Moulter. I put this question in the chat, um, but with the CDED diet, fresh foods are often also expensive. How do you assist families who might have limited resources who are trying to follow this diet? Yeah, so that actually is a concern of ours. Um, it, it, it is going to be a very difficult diet for families who have um, some financial barriers. Um, for those families, um, to be quite honest, we can get usually insurance coverage on the formulas for EEN. Um, you know, families who have SNAP money can use those funds to purchase the foods. But no, I agree. I feel like the um, there is going to be a barrier for some of our families for following the CDED. That's, that's that's something that um, I don't think has necessarily been addressed because you know we can't get insurance coverage for for real foods and for fresh foods um, and the diet does does want to promote more whole fresh foods rather than the processed foods because we know the processed foods contain a lot of um, ingredients like emulsifiers which can harm the intestinal tract and the microbiome. Um, so for those families, for the time being anyway, EEN might be a more financially cost-effective option. Dr. Altimo also asked in the chat, how is recommended diet adapted to peoples of non-Western cultures and dietary practices? I'm sorry, I had a hard time hearing. Oh, sorry, Dr. Khan, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Dr. Asamoa asked in the chat, I don't know if you can see it, he said, how is recommended, how is this recommended diet adapted to people of non-Western cultures um, and dietary practices? How is it adapted? Um, it actually hasn't necessarily been looked at in other cultures. Um, I will say a lot of non-Western cultures actually eat a diet that is um, more abundant in whole fresh foods, while a lot of the Western countries 
do tend to eat a diet that's very high in omega-6 fatty acids and very highly processed foods. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting is that in some of the developing countries, you don't see the incidence of autoimmune diseases like IBD, like you do in some of the Western cultures. Um, and we do know that the Western diet does tend to promote more inflammation in the GI tract um, and in the whole body, actually.